we know how to talk to, and we care about talking to white people, not the ones that like say, live like in Berkeley or, or somewhere like that. But we know how to talk to white people that, that aren't like, don't think that think that, you know, don't even know what woke means. And I, and, and I think that we all have some kind of empathy. You know, I was raised like a, in a, what was a Jewish, it was Jewish, it was like very working class. And so I've always had that relationship with working class people, even though that, you know, that, that aren't Jewish, that maybe tend to not be as say like liberal, but what, because, and, and I see a lot of people, you know, who, especially after the election, I see a lot of white people that want to be better than the other white people that aren't in agreement with them. And I think that we have, because of what we do, we have a responsibility, I think that we could help make change. So I would like to, to hear both of you talk about how you do that. Like how, how do you, because I know you both very good at talking to, to, to white people. Well, uh, you don't mind if I go first here. It's, 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 no, it's, please go right ahead. You go right ahead. It's, it's, it's stream of thought. But I was just thinking that when you shared, Sima, that we've learned how to talk to white people, uh, I think that it's different for each for us in the screen because uh, uh, you don't have to worry as much how white people will respond to you because you are white. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and so I've had to learn how to blend in and, and study white people. And I think, I, I think my father spent a good part of our youth training us and informing us about how not to get white men angry because he, we could lose our jobs, we could lose our rent, we could get arrested, uh, we could get fired, all these kind of things. I remember Robert Bly, a very famous poet um, out of Minnesota, and he was just talking about how his father um, groomed him to go out into the world when he was around 12 about the, you know, what the world would look like. And I said, uh, no, I said, that, that was, I got up and I said, no, that was not my experience, that was yours. I said, my experience was how to be careful for the white man. And I was very clear, my father was very clear what I could not do so that I would not aspire uh, to a places where my life would be in danger or I would not be welcomed. And, uh, and, I, and I think that that, that, that distinction is, is very important. That the, the, the problem for me as a therapist and psychologically is that for the longest time in my life is that I was always fighting the stereotypes about being an Asian man. And so, and, and so you can imagine what happens is you kind of leave this, this multiple personality because you're always worrying about how not to look Asian, to look at all the stereotypes. So you can't really fully relax to be yourself. So I want you to think about that. I mean, as usual, as a woman, you have to worry about that. But maybe if, if, if Howard doesn't decide to tell people he's a Jew, then he won't have to worry about them. He'll just be one of the guys. I remember a, a person in the film, the, uh, If These Halls Could Talk, the one I did, uh, on young people. And, and, and the young uh, Italian uh, woman says, uh, I can tell you unequivocally that I never have to worry when I go from room to room to adjust myself to the culture of the room. It'll look like the one I'm used to. Mm -hmm. I cannot imagine rooms where I go anywhere in this country where I'm not constantly having to adapt to the room. And, and uh, I, I remember when, when I was wearing my kimono and Tibetan shirts, how oftentimes somebody would say, well, aren't you afraid that you won't look professional enough? And, uh, uh, and what I said is, isn't it funny? You love to brag to the world that we're multicultural, but in fact, I believe we're monocultural and we're monolingual. And I said, and so the, the good ex you know, example of that is that how many people know five or six words from any first nation, nation tribe in the United States. And yet they were the very first people. We didn't even think about having to learn their language. So hence the template, isn't it funny that we're, we demand, white Americans demand that people of color speak English when we come here. But then when, when, when white Americans go to Japan or France or Germany, they demand that that country speak English. Otherwise it's considered uncivilized you know, or uneducated. And so, so that that world to me is, is so very different. And, uh, and I think it's still that way in my lifetime uh, Howard and Sima, I will never see a Chinese man become the president of the United States. I will never see a Muslim, maybe 
not even a first America, first people uh, being one. Uh, we might see Mexican, but I think that somebody went and we did have one black president. And by the way, of course, we had five other black ones who didn't tell anybody who they really were because of that, you know, but, but I think that 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 saddens me. And, and, and so I don't ever feel, as you said, Howard, that uh, I'm an American or even that it included me, you know, you were very right. You know, I should have been suspicious when they called it the White House. And uh, I remember a Supreme Court Justice that met Ruth Ginsburg. And he said, when she was fighting for women's rights and he says to her, one of the Supreme Court Justices, you do know the constitution does not mention women. And Ruth Ginsburg looked at him and said, and neither does it mention the word freedom, but it doesn't mean that we can't fight for it just because it's excluded. Look, I think it, it's really important. It, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's, 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 you're so on point, Manuai. You know, I, I've said for years to people, I said people who three, speak three languages, we call trilingual. People who speak two languages, we call bilingual. People who speak one language, we call <laughs> American. It's, it's exactly. <laughs> it's, it's so true. Um, you know, but I think it's, but I, I think that there's, there's at the heart of this too, that there's, there's, when you talk about reaching white people about it, I think, you know, one of the churches is that, that there's not, there's not been a lot of, um, uh, openness about us really looking at this and the challenge that it is for everybody to make this adaptation to a system that has been designed to produce exactly the result that it's producing. And I think this is one of the places where people misunderstand. Um, a lot of times we look at racism in America, we look at the separation, and for that matter, the other is of sexism and sexism and all these things. We look at these things somehow as aberrations. Um, but in reality, this is a system that's been perfectly designed to produce exactly the result that it's been producing. And this is what we talk and we mean when we talk about systemic racism. It doesn't mean that everybody in the culture is hateful. It doesn't mean white people are others, because we know that racism can, or prejudice, anyway, bias and prejudice can go both different directions. I do think it's important for people to understand something different when something becomes systemic, as in racism. It's very different, for example, Moonwalk can not like me because I'm white. And that might be prejudice and biased. And what we might say that it's too bad that he doesn't like it, that you don't like white people, but you don't have an entire system behind you to enforce that with yeah. it. And so I, all I need to, all I need to do to deal with that is say, all right, well, then why the hell with you? I'm not going to spend any time with you then, but to go down the street. But if, if, if a BIPOC person does the same thing, they're likely to run into another person on the street who, who feels exactly the same way within 10 minutes. So, so I do think it's important for us to recognize those differences. And my experience has been in working with, um, with all people. I mean, I think, you know, being white and doing this work, especially being a, a cisgendered straight white male, um, has been an interesting ride over these years. You know, when I started doing the work 35 years ago, there were like a handful of us, you know, straight yeah. white men who were doing this work around the country. And the, mo and the basic attitude was, what the hell are you doing up there? You know, <laughs> why are you doing this work? Then we went through a period over time where all of a sudden it was a good thing for white people to be doing this work because you could reach the white people. Now we're back swinging back. People say, no, white people shouldn't do this work. You know, we've gone back and forth the best. Um, you know, and it, it's not always a picnic, you know, they're, they're um, for, for some white people, there's a special kind of hate that they have for people who do this work, who are white, you know, that's, when, when I was doing civil rights work, when I was a kid, you know, it was the, you were called an end lover. Um, nowadays, a race, trader, you know, a race, race trader. trader, a race trader, all this kind of stuff. But I think ultimately, people want to be dealt with as human beings. And I think one of the mistakes that we've often made in, with folks is that we assume because people benefit from the system, that they are actively a part of that system, or they, uh, they actively achieve chosen to play that role in the system, and they actively are even conscious about the role they're playing in the system. Whereas we all know as practitioners, that one of the real, um, the real impacts of privilege is that you don't have to know that you have it. So, so when Munwa was talking about not having to go into a room and worry where you fit, for example, you know, one example that I like to give is I've got four sons, the youngest of whom is 26, and they all learned to drive and I taught them all to drive and never did I think to have a conversation with them about how to keep their sense safe if they were stopped by a police officer. And yet every African-American parent I know, every friend I have who's had a child that age has had that driving while black conversation. Every one of those parents, when the children go out in that car at the beginning of an evening, worry about 
what's going to happen before they come home. And, and it doesn't matter about socioeconomic status. You know, I had a client here in the DC area where I live, who was a very senior executive for a major corporation that, that everybody would know about, earning over $600,000 a year, lived in a very um, high end neighborhood in suburban Washington that was um, predominantly white. And he told me in tears one day in his office that his son was home from Princeton for the summer staying with him for 10 weeks and in 10 weeks was stopped four times by police officers coming in and out of his own neighborhood driving his father's car. And, and what he felt, said to me in tears, this powerful, successful, wealthy man said to me, what scared me to death was that my son would lose patience and then something horrible would happen. And, th and think about that, you know, the, the thought in his head was not about the police officer, it was about his son maintaining his son's protectiveness. Now, you know, as somebody with four, four children and six grandchildren, four of whom are of mixed race, um, I think that touches, that touches the heart, very heart of people. And, and I think one of the things that, that I found is that when we can get people to put themselves, and, and, I, and I've worked with white folks, I'm not just talking about, like you said, people who are on the left on this or something. You know, I, right. not long ago, after, after the George Floyd incident, did a workshop with, uh, with the senior leaders of an oil company in Texas, 75% of whom had voted for President Trump the last time around. So, so I think that there are ways to reach